I want to take a look at the Revolutionary War, but I want to do it in kind of a unique way. I want to do it using some of the artwork uh, that's going to come out of that war. Now, if you remember all the way back when we were looking at the Founding Fathers at the beginning of the year, we said that the United States, when it became a country, tried to do kind of a little cultural creation. Right? When you're a brand new country, you don't have history, right? You don't have uh, anything that's not related to the old country that you left, right? You don't have your own types of art and things like that. Uh, and so um, they tried to create art in the style of, um, you know, the Greeks uh, or the Romans or the Renaissance uh, to use these things. And so you see these works of art depicting moments uh, in um, the Revolutionary War that are uh, meant to you know, kind of bring up um, some of those feelings as you're looking at them. Uh, and so I want to take a look at some of the art uh, that's going to come out of this time period and use it to talk about um, kind of what we saw with uh, the Revolutionary War in general. Um, we, we see that the Revolutionary War really grows out of uh, the French and Indian War. Right? Understanding that conflict uh, is, is really essential to understanding what had gone on uh, in um, the, the country to lead up to uh, things like the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, um, and then ultimately um, Lexington, Concord, the Declaration of Independence. The, the French and Indian War, you actually see here a picture of a young Colonel George Washington who was a British soldier uh, in the French and Indian War. Um, this is not a war between the French and the Indians. This is between the French and the British. Uh, there were Native Americans who were on both sides uh, of the conflict. Um, but basically what had happened uh, is these two old enemies, right, the British and the French, are going to uh, have it out on the North American continent. Uh, well, the British, by most accounts, win uh, the French and Indian War, uh, but it cost them a lot of money. And so they decide, hey, since we were doing this to protect the American colonies, to get some of that money back, we're going to put taxes uh, on the colonies. Now, you probably remember uh, from talking about the Revolutionary War before, the uh, saying, no taxation without representation. Uh, and so that was uh, kind of the revolutionary response to that was, okay, well, you're passing these taxes over in Parliament. We don't have representatives in Parliament. Uh, we don't have any kind of say in this, uh, and so we're going to rebel against that. Uh, and we see that in some of like the Stamp Act, uh, that type of thing that the British are going to put on, the response uh, that the Colonials give, uh, things like the Boston Tea Party, uh, where they end up taking all that tea and dumping it into the ocean, really starts that conflict um, in, in a very real way. Um, one of the scenes here, and check this out, this is what's called a silver etching, this picture. Uh, and it depicts an event called the Boston Massacre. Uh, now this was actually made by a really famous American. Uh, it's the work of a guy named Paul Revere. Uh, Paul Revere, yes, guy from the poem. And uh, Paul Revere was a silversmith. And so basically this was the first kind of reproducible art. Uh, he would do this art on a piece of silver uh, and then use it like a stamp. Uh, put it in ink and then put it on a piece of paper. Uh, this one would have cost you a little more because somebody colored it, uh, you know, put the color in. Uh, and so, uh, but it depicts a incident between some of the citizens of Boston uh, and some of um, some British troops. Uh, now this looks very dramatic. Uh, when, you, when you read about uh, what actually happened in the Boston Massacre, it's, it's not necessarily uh, as dramatic, but again, it's, it's kind of propaganda like we talked about uh, earlier in this unit, um, that you're wanting to stir up feelings. You've got all these British troops are around. Uh, you've got, they've got guns. The, the guys that are fighting against them uh, don't have firearms. You see the, the man in the middle there, uh, an African-American man. Uh, his name is Crispus Attucks, uh, who's one of the, uh, the guys killed uh, in the Boston Massacre. Uh, they actually had a high school uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, that was named Crispus Attucks High School. It went away and I think maybe it came back. Uh, most famous alumni, just for you basketball fans out there, Oscar Robertson, first man to uh, average a triple-double 
uh, in an NBA season. But um, this is shows the tension, and Boston's a really great example for us at the beginning of the Revolutionary War of just a place where uh, this tension was very real. Uh, it, it was happening in a very real way, uh, and you see it sort of spilling over uh, into violence uh, in the streets. But this was uh, a silver etching. Now, let me show you another one here that wasn't colored in, but it is a silver etching of the Battle of Concord. Uh, now, those of you that came from Lexington Elementary School, you know, your mascot was the Minutemen, uh, and Lexington, Indiana is named after um, the, uh, the town in Massachusetts where this is going to happen. Uh, 1775, uh, the British get word that the revolutionaries are stockpiling weapons uh, at these places. Uh, and so you see the first incidents um, between colonial troops, kind of the militia, uh, and um, the British troops. Nobody knows who fires the first shot uh, of the Revolutionary War, but it's referred to in history as the shot heard around the world. Uh, and it's going to set, uh, set off in motion not only the American Revolution, uh, but other revolutions around the war uh, in subsequent years. Uh, if you remember, we talked in the Patriot about the need for these firing lines, walking up in a big line, just because the weapons weren't very accurate. Uh, and so you needed, um, you, you needed those uh, kind of close quarters to make sure that, that you could actually effectively shoot somebody, which wouldn't, doesn't sound uh, great to me if you said, hey, we're standing so close so some of you can get shot. Well, what if we moved away then? Uh, but um, that's the reality of colonial weapons. Um, one of the things you see that we start to use are tactics like guerrilla warfare. Again, going back to the Patriot, uh, you know, this idea of, you know, if we stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with these professional soldiers on a battlefield, it's not going to go very well. Uh, and so let's, you know, let's use sneak attacks. Um, you know, let's use those types of things to, uh, to help kind of even the odds uh, between the two groups. Uh, this painting, very dramatic, very much, uh, if you're familiar with Renaissance painting, very much in the, uh, in the Renaissance style, depicts the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, Bunker Hill's in Boston. Uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill actually didn't happen on Bunker Hill. Uh, it happened on Breed's Hill, but uh, got a little bit of a misnomer there. Bunker Hill sounds better anyway. Uh, but there was a small fort uh, at the top of the hill uh, that's taken over by colonials. Uh, obviously, the, the British didn't like that very much, so they will eventually send troops in uh, to run them out. Um, and wave after wave uh, of British troops uh, come up this hill, uh, and the colonials just kind of fight to the death. Uh, they start to run out of ammo. And the commander of these troops will utter the famous line, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes, right? You see the white part of their eyes, you're close enough, you're going to be able to hit. Uh, the story is told that they actually, uh, as they ran out of ammunition, started to put rocks in the barrels of their guns. Uh, you can hear some stories of utensils out of their, um, their mess kits, uh, things like that, uh, that, uh, that they would stick in. Always reminds me of that scene from Pirates of the Caribbean, where the guy with the wooden eye gets the fork. Uh, stuck in there. I don't know why. It's just a goofy way my mind works. Um, but Battle of Bunker Hill, again, very very dramatic style we're trying to depict there. Uh, you've seen this picture before. This is the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, didn't actually happen, right? We said these guys weren't in the same room together. Probably would have been pretty unsafe uh, for them to be in the same room together when they signed it. Uh, but you see some famous Americans. I've seen breakdowns of this picture where uh, the, the different guys from the different states who did sign it are depicted. And so if you'd been from that state, you could look and say, oh, yeah, that's, those are our guys uh, that were a representative. Most everybody would have known the tall, red-headed gentleman in the middle. That's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and then uh, to, to the right of him in the painting is uh, Benjamin Franklin. So those guys would have been uh, fairly recognizable to their countrymen. Uh, but again, just trying to depict this really famous moment, right? This moment where we declare independence. Uh, and so you have this dramatic painting uh, of that being adopted. Um, the first flag in our country, we've got another, another silver etching here, uh, is supposed to have been made by uh, Betsy Ross. Uh, and so uh, we see her uh, depicted here. Um, the story goes, and if you ever get a chance to, uh, to head out to um, 
Philadelphia. Her home is there. Uh, that they came to her and, and basically said, this is kind of what we want the flag to look like. We want it to be red, white, and blue. We want some stars representing the colonies. Uh, and then she is supposed to have um, designed uh, the first flag. Uh, our flag, really, if you look at that early example, hasn't changed a ton. We had stars for states, um, but those red and white stripes for the 13 original colonies are still there. Um, the red, white, and blue uh, is, uh, is still there. Uh, like I said, for a long time she's been given credit. There are people that, that doubt that, but those people are just no fun, right? Um, they don't like just the, the cool stories of things. It's like, oh, we got to be serious and historically accurate and things. Um, but uh, I'm just kidding. I, I like that kind of stuff too. But, um, you know, uh, you know the, the story is one that, that gets told and told um, throughout American history. Um, George Washington, this is a, a painting later of George Washington, um, is obviously extremely important in the Revolutionary War and in the period of time that follows. Uh, I put this painting in because I, I like this one. This actually happened after he retired as president. George Washington, very famously, right, had bad teeth. Uh, had false teeth and, uh, and, and you hear a lot of stories about that. And so uh, he didn't like to smile uh, with uh, where you could see his teeth. Uh, and so when he smiled, it was always kind of buttoned up. Um, but story told, guy comes out to Mount Vernon to paint this uh, picture, and the uh, former president is not happy about having to sit for a portrait. Uh, and so he's, he's kind of squirmy, not being very cooperative, until the artist went and told Martha Washington, his wife, uh, that he wasn't behaving. Uh, and apparently after a quick talking to, uh, the president sat very still uh, and finished uh, the portrait. Um, another portrait here is kind of a guy on the opposite side, right? This is Benedict Arnold. Uh, now, probably if you've heard the term Benedict Arnold, it's become synonymous in our country with being a traitor. Uh, and that's because Benedict Arnold's probably the most famous traitor in American history. Um, he was an officer underneath George Washington. George Washington really liked Benedict Arnold, uh, trusted him a great deal. Um, and he was in charge of the defense of a place called West Point. Uh, which would later on become where the uh, United States uh, Army has their military academy. Uh, he'd become disgruntled, kind of felt like he was being passed over, wasn't getting a fair shot in the colonial army. So he reaches out to the British about um, changing sides. Uh, and so they, they agree that he can change sides. He actually uh, makes a plan to deliver the fort to them uh, and maybe even George Washington. Uh, if the timing can work out, uh, he's supposed to be around close. Uh, and so he could have delivered George Washington into the hands of the British. Luckily for us, that doesn't happen. Uh, there uh, are a couple of guys that are, are intercepted carrying some papers that kind of allude to what's going on. Uh, and Benedict Arnold will escape before, uh, before he's captured. But uh, like I said, his, uh, his name becomes synonymous with uh, being a traitor uh, to your country. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette uh, is a Frenchman. Uh, who is greatly involved in um, the Revolutionary War. In that movie, The Patriot, we saw, right, you've got um, Jean, who, who comes over and helps to train the troops. Uh, well, the Marquis de Lafayette was a representative of the king, uh, and he was dispatched to the United States to see if these revolutionaries had a chance of beating the British. Uh, and so he hangs out with George Washington, sees what's going on, and goes back and convinces the king to support uh, the colonials. And French support was essential uh, in the colonists winning the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so Marquis de Lafayette is a very good friend to our country. Uh, stories told in World War I that when uh, John J. Pershing uh, arrives in France uh, to help out there, he visited the grave of the Marquis de Lafayette. It's supposed to have said, Lafayette, we're here, uh, implying that you helped us in our time of need. We're here to help you in yours. Um, and so, very important guy uh, in American history. He'll come over uh, once the country gets started and writes a famous book uh, about the development of American society. Uh, this is another really dramatic war picture, right? You can see the motion, you almost smell the smoke and hear the cannon fire. This is George Washington in the middle. A um, couple of things that are important about this. This is my favorite George Washington story. Uh, it takes place at the Battle of Monmouth. Uh, it's also one of the only times you'll see George Washington not on a white horse, not on Nelson. 
Uh, and the reason is, the Battle of Monmouth, the Colonials were actually going to win, uh, which was a rare occurrence. George Washington was known a little bit more for his retreats uh, than his victories, right? His force was greatly outnumbered uh, in most skirmishes. But he's going to win the Battle of Monmouth. Uh, the British start to flee, and he orders uh, his field commander to pursue. The field commander doesn't want to do that. Uh, his, his men are worn out, doesn't want to pursue, uh, and so he kind of ignores the order. Uh, when he does, the British go across the hill, reform, and then come back uh, and almost snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. George Washington is so fired up by what he sees, he jumps on the nearest horse and rides himself into the middle of the battle, uh, looking at the man and calling him a damned poppin' jay. I'm not really sure what kind of colonial slam that is, but next time you're upset with somebody, uh, instead of going to really hard profanity, just call him a damned poppin' jay, and you're following in the fine tradition uh, of uh, President Washington when, uh, when you do that. But he comes back, ends up turning the tide of the battle, uh, and the colonials end up uh, winning anyway. But it's one of the only times people report seeing George Washington lose his temper. Uh, and so he was, he was pretty fired up and you know, slinging around the profanity there pretty uh, roughly too. Uh, Molly Pitcher uh, is another interesting story. One of the things as we look at these wars is we're going to look at the roles of women uh, in these wars. Uh, obviously with the Revolutionary War, a lot of times these battles and things are happening around people's homes. Um, and Molly Pitcher had a husband who was um, a guy that worked on a cannon crew uh, for the Colonials. Uh, when her, she was carrying water uh, from their home out to uh, the soldiers use that obviously for drinking, but also for cooling the barrel of the cannon. Because if, if it got too hot, it could melt. Uh, and then if that cannonball can't get out and you uh, light that fuse, everybody around it's in a world of hurt. Supposedly when one of the guys falls, uh, she ends up loading the cannon. Uh, and so becomes uh, a woman who is directly involved in combat uh, in the Revolutionary War. So this is another silver etching uh, that's made kind of uh, depicting her story uh, of heroism uh, during the conflict. Uh, probably the most famous picture of the Revolutionary War is this one. Uh, it's Washington crossing the Delaware. This painting in real life is enormous. Um, the Delaware River separated um, the British forces and American forces uh, in uh, I want to say the winter of 1778, but I, I'm not entirely sure about that. You, you check me out on that one. Uh, but George Washington, uh, around Christmas, actually sneaks over to, uh, to the other side and surprises a bunch of German mercenaries, a bunch of Hessians that the British have uh, hired to come help fight with them in the Revolutionary War uh, and ends up capturing them without firing a shot. He comes over, it had been a holiday celebration, uh, and so the guys had uh, gotten... Uh, pretty liquored up, uh, and so was able to come in and capture them. Cool thing about this painting, you see George Washington very dramatically standing there in the front. There are also two other presidents in the boat with him. James Monroe and James Madison uh, are both depicted uh, in the scene. Now, uh, for it to be a surprise attack, it's going to be the middle of the night uh, as they're paddling across. Uh, so this would, if you did it accurately, would just be probably a black screen. Um, but... Uh, that doesn't make for a very good painting. So uh, you kind of dramatically light it and they're coming across and breaking the ice up uh, as they come across the river uh, for the surprise attack. Uh, George Washington, like I said, was, was the most famous man of his day and, and most people give him credit for carrying his army through the dark times. Uh, his men loved him, kind of like a great coach that run through a wall for him. Um, and his faith uh, is something that sustained him. Uh, this is a, a painting of him in a moment at Valley Forge, uh, his white horse Nelson behind him, uh, praying for guidance uh, in, in what he's supposed to, uh, what he's supposed to do. Uh, this is Admiral. Right, this guy is John Paul Jones. He's looked at as being the father of uh, the American Navy. He and John Adams is one of the first famous naval commanders. But again, just kind of in that. Uh, same style of celebrating people who are uh, important to um, important to uh, the the colonial effort. Um, 
Alexander Hamilton, right, our first Secretary of the Treasury. This is an engraving that was made. You've probably seen this one if you've got a uh, $10 bill in your pocket. Uh, but he served during the Revolutionary War. Kind of famously, if you've seen that musical, uh, had some conflicts with George Washington because he wanted to be in command of troops, um, but um, wasn't able to, to do that. He was an assistant to Washington. Washington really didn't want to give him up. Um, but he is, um, you know, if you've seen that, uh, that story, eventually does get command of his own troops. But this is an engraving uh, that, uh, like I said, will eventually be made into his image on currency. Uh, Surrender at Yorktown uh, is the end of the Revolutionary War. This is another one of those Renaissance style paintings uh, depicting that. Lord Cornwallis gets surrounded by the Americans and the French uh, and is forced to surrender. And you have a dramatic upset, right? The most powerful uh, nation in the world being defeated by kind of a ragtag army of uh, colonials bringing in to, uh, to that particular conflict. Um, We've got uh, this last one here is one called the Spirit of 76. If you remember doing the propaganda uh, lesson a little earlier, I showed you uh, the Spirit of 18, which is a propaganda post for World War I that plays off of this. This picture is enormous in real life. Uh, my wife and I actually got to see it. We were on a trip uh, out in Massachusetts. Took a bus trip to Salem for the day where the witch trials were. As we drove back, uh, the bus driver pulled over, let us go into this kind of random courthouse somewhere in Massachusetts, uh, and there was the spirit of 76. Um, and so um, I know what you're thinking, the guy in the middle looks a lot like Doc Brown. Uh, and there may be something to that whole DeLorean time travel thing, uh, but this is supposed to represent the colonial spirit. Uh, these guys continuing to march forward, uh, not only until the end of the conflict, but, but in the creation of uh, American history and, and in our history up until this point, uh, that the, the same kind of um, spirit uh, is leading us uh, even until today. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed this look at some art from depicting the revolution uh, or from the revolutionary period. Uh, maybe someday you run across one of these paintings and you're like, hey, I remember that from somewhere. Maybe you remember your old friend, Mr. Bagwell. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you at the War of 1812.